Now, he's a tricky character, this one, difficult to maneuver where we want him, when we want him, which is now. So will you please come outside the street, outside our theater, and see if we have maneuvered him? Gathering around. Yeah, we'll cut them right back. We haven't got them here yet, but uh, a lot of traffic, a lot of people going around the top of Shepherd Bush Green. And let's hope that our man arrives at the point, well, you'll see the point if he arrives. You do see the crowd gathered outside. I'm not quite sure where our camera is looking. It's because they've seen a camera poke outside the door, even though we've hidden the name of the show on tonight, just in case our guests should get something closer than a premonition. Looks like trouble. Well, now, let's see, a speed cop, eh? Well, let me tell you, he's not a policeman at all. He's an actor. The people in the car don't know that, but we do. All right, never mind the notebook. I got a different sort of a summons. Sterling Moss, there's the camera tonight. This is your night. <laughs> Seat. You know, we thought of putting a microphone in that car, but we had heard some of the things that you're alleged to have said to speed cops, so we thought we'd take the microphone out. This is well, <laughs> You're telling me. Anyway, Sterling Moss, virtuoso of the steering wheel, this is your life. Now, most of us only know you as a sort of robot in a racing car. Remote and dedicated, come and gone in the wink of an eye. A young man in a hurry who knows where he's going and usually gets there first. Now that's today. Let's look at yesterday, or rather 25 years ago. Even then, a young man in a hurry. Only 25 years between those two films. And then today, if we want to even look at today. Today's paper, for instance, this morning, this morning's headline. There it was. 99 miles an hour, Sterling Moss does it again. From boy to man, from obscurity to fame, from a bob a week pocket money to the salary of a prime minister. From start to finish, yours might be the story of one of your own racing engines. Highly tuned, liable to blow up at times, but the source of tremendous tireless energy. Now, Moss, pay attention. You know that's strictly forbidden. Now, you're paying a little more attention to her now than you did then. It's a voice you haven't heard for 20 years. Your schoolmistress, Miss Peggy Shaw. <laughs> now, 
Now, Miss Shaw, I want to ask you, what was it that was so strictly forbidden? Well, nothing in particular, but everything in general. <laughs> he had more than his share of energy, and I soon learned that I had to keep my eyes, and I had to have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> and, and, um... You, you, you said it became almost a habit. It became, so oh, it did, stage, yes. And I, used to, I used to say, if whatever you're doing, Moss, don't do it. <laughs> he, wasn't all, he wasn't always there to say it to, was he? No. Do you remember when you climbed out your dormitory over the flat roof and went for a day on the River Bray? Yes, of I did. Of course, that was strictly <laughs> forbidden. <laughs> now, I hope, uh, strictly forbidden to know, Miss Shaw, that there was no uh, ill will between the two oh, of you. Oh, no, not at all. Now, I've still got... A little present that he gave me. Oh. I still treasure it. Here it is. You remember oh, giving me that? Yes, I do. <laughs> well, well, yes. from a ten-year-old schoolboy to a schoolmistress. Obviously, a very fast mover, even in those days. A <laughs> bottle of evening in Paris. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much, Miss Shaw. <laughs> well, now, before moving on towards the present, a quick look at the past. Lucky for you, you've always had a sort of a craze for physical fitness, even from a, an early age. Workouts such as this were to pay dividends in later years. Oh boy, he's so tough there. <laughs> Yet it was a close thing because you nearly became a member of a far more respectable profession than uh, motor racing. You might have spent your day saying, open wider please, as a dentist. And if I'd had my way, he would have. Yes, the odds were two to one against you, Sterling. You know, of course, your father and your mother, Mr. and Mrs. Moss. <laughs> Wonder if I'd summarize the whole thing as headstrong son overcomes family opposition. I think so. <laughs> as a matter of fact, I wanted him to follow in my profession. But when I asked him what he wanted to do for a living... He said, well, I want to be a professional race driver. And that uh, started the uh, fireworks. I'm afraid it did. <laughs> he, could, he couldn't tell his mother or I that we didn't know what we were talking about, because we did. Indeed you did. Both of you had done more than a bit of Mosa racing in your time. You at Indianapolis and you, Mrs. Moss, had become a um, woman champion in England, hadn't you? Yes, but the thing to make Sterling realise that we did that for fun. <laughs> we were amateurs. And it cost us a lot of money. But uh, from a mother's point of view... I'd much rather use pulling out teeth. It's much safer. <laughs> well, nevertheless, we know that both of you have been right behind him from start to every inch of the road he's gone now. And thank you very much, Mr. and Mrs. Mott. Thank you. <laughs> and so, only 12 years ago, with uh, a little Cooper car, he set up business as the first real professional racing driver in this country. The first one they've known. Unsponsored, except by his family, and unknown to the motor racing world, a young man sets out to catch and overtake the masters of his profession. 1948, the Chelsea Walsh Hill Climb. Your entry is not accepted. They say, who is this S. Moss, anyway? Next, the Prescott Hill Climb. In fourth place, S. Moss. Then, Stanmer Park, S. Moss, first. That was the day we both got our names in the papers for the first time. Well, like you, he's come a long way since then. From Paris, your ex-fellow novice, you said it? Lance Macklin. Lance Macklin! <laughs> well, now, that was a very special day for you both, but I don't suppose you had much time to notice young Moss, had you? Oh, yes, I noticed him all right. Yes, he gave me quite a lot of trouble, actually. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't really meet him properly until, um, it was Rass. I first met you at, mm. um, when I joined the HWM team. I remember it was the first time I tried to follow Sterling round in about the same car, and I followed him round in practice, and I thought to myself, well, this fellow certainly doesn't hang about anyway. You... <laughs> That's how I felt about Lance with his girlfriends, I might say, <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> yeah, we know something about that, too, so I wouldn't say too much about Lance if I were you. <laughs> oh. Well, anyway, the way Lance put it uh, is one way of putting it, but uh, you, you raced against each other many times, didn't you? Oh, yes, we raced um, all over the continent. I think he gave me more trouble off the track than on the track because um, we were both pretty young men in those days and we used to sort of chase around a bit together. In fact, one day I remember he, um, we were down in Naples and old yeah. Sterling, because I told him I could introduce him to Miss France, he asked me to take him all the way up to Monte Carlo to meet her, which is about 700 miles. That's what I mean, we know about things. And did you, uh, <laughs> did you take him? 
Yes, we went up to, to Monte Carlo. When we got there, unfortunately, Miss France had just left. Uh, oh. <laughs> so what happened? Back again. Yes, we went all the way back to Naples again. <laughs> 700 miles, I might add. Yes. Well, now, Lance, as one expert on another, what's so special about Sterling here on the racetrack? Well, I don't know. I'd, in my own experience, I'd say that he's unique in his own way because he, I think probably his most extraordinary thing is he's got this tremendous power of concentration and he can sort of keep up an extraordinary high speed. Um, as far as I could see, sort of indefinitely. I used to get tired after sort of half an hour or an hour of racing. Little Sterling beginning sort of belting on without any sort of trouble at all. Thank you very much, Lance Macklin. Thank you. By 1950, your 21st year, no doubt about it, this is what the crowd paid to see. Here is something being done almost as well as it can be done. The margin between mediocrity and perfection, perhaps one second in every mile. Still, up to now, in a way, it had been a sort of small-time stuff. Small engines and small cars. Then comes a chance to move up into the senior grade, to race in the tourist trophy, the TT at Dundraw. If, that's a big if, if you can get a car to drive. Hey, Sterling, I must say, I liked your nerve asking me if you could drive my car. Well, it's a good thing for you, he said, Jess, because he's one of your earliest fans, motoring correspondent of the Daily Herald, Tommy Wisdom. I can tell you he spotted you before you had the first word said. <laughs> and the car that Sterling was after was, in fact, a brand new Jaguar XK120, wasn't it? Yes, it was straight off the assembly line. As a matter of fact, uh, the makers weren't too pleased uh, about Sterling uh, driving it because, uh, well, it was his first big car and uh, they'd just turned him down to the works team. <laughs> <laughs> so it seems as if you're rather sticking your neck out then and making the offer. No, 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 not, nothing, not, nothing like that. Uh, um, we'd, some of us had spotted Sterling for a long time. We knew he was on the up and up and was going to make the grade. Well, your gamble paid off then? Yes, rather. Sterling, yes. in a pouring rain, just walked that race and beat all the works drivers. Well, you were the important link between the old and the new Sterling Moss, and thank you very much, Mr. Wisdom. Tell me Wisdom. So 1951, your most hectic year and your most successful. Sterling Moss has most definitely arrived, and more often than not, has arrived first. The end of 1951, you're on top of the world. Two minutes ahead of anyone else, the checkered flag signaled another win for Sterling Moss, his second successive triumph in this race. In a one-day early celebration of his 22nd birthday, Sterling Moss and his Jaguar winner Dundrod made up in part for the BRM's disappointment at Monza. Not only top of the world in 1951, but winner of the Gold Star, the British Racing Drivers' Championship. But only two years later, Sterling, you were ready to throw your hand in. Up like a rocket, down like a stick. No one had a better view than your friend and personal manager, Ken Gregory. Now, <laughs> uh, we gather from all that the 52 and 53 were uh, setback years, Ken, huh? They were indeed, Eamon. Uh, Sterling was engaged to drive two cars, uh, the Cooper Alta and the ERA. Unfortunately, um, they were both very much underdeveloped. And although we tried our best and did many things, at the last moment something always went wrong. Yeah, on one occasion with uh, disastrous results. Yes, and very expensive results too. <laughs> because he was driving in the Grand Prix de Europe at Spa, and uh, unfortunately the, the engine blew up and the Conrod came to the side. It locked the engine up altogether and threw the car off the road, burst into flames, but Sterling jumped out and singed his bootlaces. Just as well it was only his bootlaces. Now, that was a, a bad period, but in all, Ken, you've been Sterling's manager for... About eight years, is it? Yes, eight years. So you've more or less given him the best years of your life, huh? I think so. <laughs> what has he given you in... Hair, anyway. <laughs> he has more hair, but apart from that, what... <laughs> what has he given you in return? Well, amongst other things, he's given me two nervous breakdowns, but I don't think I'd do that. <laughs> uh, there's only one thing I wish he'd learn to relax a bit. This is about the first time I haven't seen him doing anything. He's either designing a house or a car or a boat or something. <laughs> well, he's hopping up and down, but thanks very much, Ken Gregory. Oh, Thank sorry. you. Thank you.
1954, for Sterling Moss, this is the year of the glorious failure. As a private owner in a tried and true Maserati, he challenges the rest of the motor racing world. And what's more, racing against factory teams with their hordes of mechanics. And now and again, he's handing them out a beating. One man and a car scaring the daylights out of the big combines. To be fair, two men and a car. One man to drive it, one man to keep it going. Hello, Sterling. I'm still catching up on the sleep I lost working for you. <laughs> still losing it. Yes, he's still losing it. That's the mechanic behind the scenes. And here from Modena, Italy, he arrived literally minutes ago from London Airport, Al Francis. Well, here's the other half of that two-man team. So we gather from what you said that Sterling worked you pretty hard, Al. He certainly did, I must say. But uh, looking back at it, I think it was very satisfying. <laughs> yeah, all right. But you told me about how many nights sleep you didn't, uh, you know, get. However, did you and Sterling always see I and I together? In majority cases, never. <laughs> well, sometimes, Al. <laughs> but then again... Uh, Whatever arguments we had, we just worked like two brothers. I mean, we could have been arguing, but we still were aiming at the same sort of, at the same, to the same end. And uh, one way or the other, I enjoyed working for him. I bet you did. What, what was he like um, as, a, as a boss? As a boss? Actually, if I'm, a, I'm allowed to say so, when he offered me to work for him, I nearly fell over because such a good proposition he put me up. I never expected Sterling Moss could do it. <laughs> now, what about... Uh, this is a hard question to ask you, Alf, and we haven't had time to sort of prepare it, but what about your assessment of him as a racing driver? Well, that's a difficult question to answer because, from my own opinion, since I only met him in 1951, I come to realize he is a champion. Now, I think he is the greatest living. Thank you very much, Alf Francis. Thank you. Next year, 1955, might be called for Sterling Moss the year of the Mercedes. The Mercedes is back again on the starting grid. And what greater compliment could there be that Sterling Moss, that you should be chosen to drive it? Ahead of you now are the years of fulfillment. The fulfillment for you of a special dream to be first past the checkered flag, driving not the racing red of Italy nor the silver of Germany, but the dark green of Britain. At last, 1956, here it was, the Van Wall Special. With you... As everyone knows, with you at the wheel, you were as good as, is it not better than the best. And 1957 brings with it another kind of success. Marriage. After a hard day's driving, a wife to come home to, a chair by the fire to relax in. Don't be silly, Amy. Sterling never relaxes. <laughs> the voice of his long-suffering wife, Katie Moss. <laughs> Well, uh, thank you for all the help today, Katie. He can get at you afterwards over this. But I believe that you're one of the greatest gin rummy experts in Europe. Well, Eamon, if I'm not, I should be. Because <laughs> Sterling and I travel many, many thousands of miles each year in a plane. And I usually like to, well, sit and look out the window or write letters. But he's always saying, well, come on, come on, let's play something. Gin rummy or cribbage or something. And he just never relaxes. Now, with all this uh, traveling around, you must have watched him race in a good many different places. Yes, I have. Uh, but he changes, I think, when he gets on the track. He becomes a different sort of person, and he often sort of doesn't recognize me. I know the times that I've sort of stood in the pits, and he's looked sort of right by me. <laughs> but uh, off the track, he notices you, I bet. He better. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, look, Katie, maybe you can have him relax by sitting beside him now for the rest of this program, would you? Thank you, Katie Moss. Well, Al Sterling, relaxation may be difficult for you, but there are times you sit back and watch television. For example, I'm thinking of a 
certain evening when you watched this program, Associated Rediffusion's People in Trouble. Bates caught polio four years ago when he was doing his national service as an officer in Malaya. He was 21 years old, a rugger player and a good athlete. He has been kept alive by this machine ever since. You seem to have a remarkably full life, plus those are things that you miss very acutely. And that's quite true because recently I went to London to go to hospital for about six weeks. And uh, it was then that I first realized that I was really missing the countryside and that sort of thing. Would there be any chance that you could travel about? If I had a suitable vehicle, I could be out tomorrow. He said, if I had a vehicle, I would get out tomorrow. Now, perhaps there, Sterling, you recognized a, another independent spirit because Paul has played quite a part in your life, hasn't he? We let him take up the story. But Stan, do you remember when you first telephoned me after watching that program? You said your name was Moss, but I wouldn't pay you from Adam. I think you were surprised when I recognized your voice. Soon after that, you came to see me, you and Katie, and we talked racing. At 14, I'd seen your first race in the crowd, of course, and later at Goodwood, it was one of the last things I did before I went to Malaya. Own literature like this. You discussed the possibility of adapting a fan and getting me out and about. You went over absolutely every detail. Your very generous gift helped so much towards turning my dream into reality. You took me on the first memorable drive, and several times since have been my chauffeur. Some chauffeur. Seriously, sir, I know it is your wish that your generosity should remain a secret, and I hope you'll forgive me for breaking my word, but it's a wonderful opportunity to join with your friends tonight and offer my own tribute. Thank you, Paul Bates. Thank you. <laughs> well, now, Sterling, your story would be incomplete without a word from the greatest racing driver of them all, Juan Fangio, and he would be here right now if he were not appearing on television in Italy at this moment. But he sent a message especially to you from him, the retired, undefeated champion of the world, Juan Fangio. Carlos Kirli, yo sé que hoy tu país te brinda un homenaje. Lamentablemente me encuentro lejos porque en este momento estoy en el Automóvil Club de Roma. I send you a salute from the Royal Automobile Club of Rome. I'm really happy that today you're being tributed in England because this tribute is highly deserved. I'm only sorry that I'm unable to be personally present. But at this moment, I cannot leave Italy. I always remember with pleasure and a bit of nostalgia the days we have spent together on the tracks of Europe, often as opponents always as friends. Thank you, Juan Fancho. I translated what he said. I didn't understand it, but I'm sure you did. I know Katie did. She told us most of what it was. Now, before we close this book, a success story, if ever there was one, and incidentally, as such, honored by the Queen by the award of the OBE, I might add, Sterling, that some of the things we slipped up on today 
We had hoped to smuggle out of your flat before you got here. Another war that you had, but we slipped up on that one. Didn't we, Katie? <laughs> He's the only racing driver ever for courage, initiative, and achievement who've been awarded the Seagrave Trophy. Now, I don't know why we slipped up, because Katie promised me she'd try and get it. Would you please tell us, Katie, how you haven't got it with us here tonight? Yes, I will, Eamon. Actually, I got three-quarters of the way down the stairs, and I said... Oh, cigarettes. He said, I've got some. Oh. <laughs> I could do. I knew something was wrong because Katie promised to have it here, but she didn't. All right. Well, now, there is just one more voice for you to hear, Sterling. And it's a voice that you never expected to hear again. It dates back only 12 years, but it's a reminder of the long, long way that you've come in that short time. I want you to think of yourself back in 1947, a, a grimy kid with a second-hand sports car, and not much else except ambition. Sharing with you those long hours in your father's workshop, sweating to get it right, was an ex-German prisoner of war, general handyman turned amateur mechanic. You know how it is, don't you, and who it is? Yes, That's right. And we found him in Aschau, a little village in Bavaria, your first mechanic and your first fan, Don Muller. <laughs> Well, Donna is very nervous about all this, but you must have had a lot of faith in Sterling to believe in him even before he'd started, Don. I to told him many times. I knew one of those days he would become one of the greatest racing drivers of the world. One of the greatest racing drivers of the world. Well, Don, you said it first, but today we're right with you. Sterling Moss, so be this is your life. Barbara Mullen from Dr. Finley's casebook is the guest next week at the same time. <laughs>